You ready for this? I'm grabbing the bucket. Okay, it's new frog time. Okay. Thank you. Bucket. Okay. One over there. Already. That's so, good. Okay. Are you ready okay. for this? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay right. first up, we got a new power supply. Okay, so we have these new power supplies, and we actually um, started ordering these before the Raspberry Pi Model B Plus came in. Um, they are two amp 5 volt power supplies with mm. a USB port. These are really great if you um, want to power like a Linux machine, like a BeagleBone Black or Raspberry Pi, because they can supply 10, uh, sorry, uh, 5 volts, 2 amps. And we have two versions. One, uh, can you go back to, has a USB port. And you okay. can plug in like, you can actually, it has iPhone resistors, quote unquote, iOS resistors. So you can plug in a tablet and it'll charge it 2 amps, or an iPhone and it'll charge it like an amp or whatever. Um, so that's, you can do that. You can use any USB cable you want. The thing is, if you're drawing two amps, though, a lot of USB cables are kind of cheap, and they have really, really thin wires in them, because, like, you're like, oh, I got this yeah. dollar USB cable. Yeah, it's because the wires are, like, 30 gauge. It's fine if you're just, like, plugging in something for data, but it's not good enough if you're drawing mm. two amps. No. And all engineers know you got to watch the gauge well, of your wires. I tell people in the Trinket book, 50% of the issues are off, are USB Pretty much cable. their USB cable. USB, you yeah. you wouldn't believe. Like I've seen the that's not like the <laughs> power only USB cables that have data lines. I'm saying it's gonna get USB cable, but we also have a version of this power supply that has a USB cable built in, mm. and it's an extra thick wire. It's 20 gauge, which is like really thick for a strand of wire. So it's it's a nice hefty cable, and it will only drop like 0.2 volts even if you're drawing a full two amps. So like, it's totally great for use with uh, your. Anything that has a micro USB connector, especially a Raspberry Pi model B plus, because you have the four USB ports. But of course, you can use anything else that needs to be powered by micro okay. USB. I'm also going to mention this. So we go above and beyond. So this is a UL. UL SCC CE. Yeah. High quality power supply. And, and so this, super clean power doesn't droop or flicker. Yeah, this is actually a high quality one. And so uh, we're at the point where. Big institutional buyers, um, when they contact us, they actually require this now. They're like, hey, is, it you, is, is your stuff UL and all that? Yeah. So we're not the cheapest. There are definitely super sketchy, cheap uh, ones that you can get out there. Don't want to. But people are like, oh, I can get something from Deal Extreme for a buck. And I'm like, yeah, yeah good luck with yeah. that. But we really spent a lot of time on this. So yeah, if you're going to plug this into your $65 Linux board, you know, power it yeah. the right way. And they have a little bit of headroom. If you look, this one I think is 5.1 volts, and the other one yeah. is like 5.2. There's a little bit of extra voltage headroom, so with the voltage drop across the cable, it'll still, it will never get below like 4.8 volts, even at like full current draws. This is a really good choice if you want to run a big monitor off, you know, if you have like a screen and a Raspberry Pi and Wi Fi and like, you know, an SDR radio, all that good stuff. This is a good pack yeah. to get. All right, All right, next up. So we got some battery. We got this battery. This is actually a, a battery that I got for a special purpose. This is a, a two amp hour um, uh, Li Poly battery, standard, rechargeable Li Poly battery, 3.7 volt nominal, 4.2 volt max. Works with every one of our Li Poly chargers. I specifically got it because it fits perfectly <laughs> into the one, battery pack. Do you want to do the overhead? Let's do the overhead so I can just show it. This is like the, exactly the perfect. Whoa, there's like all this stuff. Um, for the uh, battery shield that we actually just put back in stock, um, this battery fits in exactly. I had it like custom fitted, nice. and it's two amp hour, so this will run your parts for a long time. And it doesn't; it's not too tall, so you can stack a shield on top. And uh, yeah, it's a great battery. So that's what I got it for. But it's also handy in case you ever need a you know two amp hour battery at a good price. Okay. Use it with any of our chargers. We have All many right. light poly batteries. Moving right along. So. Uh Little display. Little okay, we display. We have teeny displays and big displays. This is a teeny one. Yeah. It's a 1.44 inch uh, diagonal TFT display. It's a TFT, so it actually has pretty good color, 120 by 120 pixels. It's low cost. It works with Arduino. You know, we have like projects. It actually uses the same chipset as the 1.8 inch TFT. It just cuts off the bottom 32 pixels, whatever. Um, it's great for little projects. It actually looks really good. There's a micro USB so you can display images. We have code tutorial. I don't have a demo for it, but you know, it's a display. You can see the images and imagine how big it is. Okay. All right. We're lying along. Next up. Oh, this one is a bigger display. This is our capacitive 2.8 inch TFT breakout. So if you want to add a capacitive 2.8 inch TFT with touch, single touch display, it's beautiful, it's colorful. Um, it's got capacitive touch. A lot of people have been asking for capacitive touch, not just resistive. Um, capacitive touch has a, a much nicer feel. Also, the display looks much better because there's no um, 
you know, rough overlay that overlays like pure glass and it's patterned. And I even have a demo for it over here. If you can go to the overhead. I just have it here at Wired. Oh, Hello. sorry. That's that me. Happens That's a me with me. Yeah. Um, ask for engineers. Ask, <laughs> ask the engineer and yeah. the engineer. Um, so this is uh, the display. You can tell it's got a nice black background. And then instead of using your fingernail, you actually use your fingertip, just like you know most smartphones these days and most devices these days. So yeah. Oh, can you turn off autofocus? So is the yeah, buffering on the display, or is it buffering. in the processor? Sorry, what'd you say? Is the buffering in the processor or the display? Oh, the display. It actually has internal video RAM. This is one of the yeah. many of the displays we have, like the one we bought before. They're not raw displays. They actually yeah. have VRAM inside the display, so you write to it with SPI or 8-bit. So this can be used by like like this is why an Arduino, which has like no memory at all, can drive it. But you can also connect it, for example, to um, a Raspberry Pi. A Beagle Bone. If there's, we have example code for Raspberry Pi, and I think also Beagle Bone for this display. So you can use um, uh, Python uh, PIL, the Python Imaging Library, mm -hmm. or Pi Game, or whatever, to just display directly onto. Okay. It. Here's a question for the engineers. Yeah. Either one of you can take it. What's the difference between capacitive screens and resistive screens? Re resistive screens oh. have two <laughs> thin layers. No, because like I'm gonna give you a little yeah. Jeopardy buzzer. After right now, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. No, because I knew everyone was gonna ask. It's two little layers that they have um, resistive um, fill, uh, coatings, and when you press the button, or you press it, the uh, screen with your fingertip, you're actually shorting the two layers together, and it acts like a potentiometer. You're shorting these two mm -hmm. conductive layers. Okay. And then the, the resistance, resi resistivity of the layers is what gets measured with capacitive. It actually, um, your body acts as a, cap uh, as a fluid thing. Yeah. Yeah, so it's you... You it's have to touch it with your finger. You can't use your nail. You actually have to be conductive right. to your Correct. hand. It has to be skin. It has to be skin. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or a banana. <laughs> you can use fruit. Yeah? Fruit is good. Fruit, okay. Yeah, if you're holding fruit, you can that's, use fruit. That's where the name of the company came from. It, it, it's things that you can make it, work with a touch screen. <laughs> the, well, people, the, the, what people like about capacitive is that it's it, this. You don't have to push on it. It's just, right. you, just, you can just uh, glide okay. your finger over. So it's a much nicer feel. Also, you never have to calibrate it because the calibration is fixed, so you, it never goes out of calibration like resistive does. And it also looks better, it looks much clearer because it's just this glass covering instead of the resistive covering. So, but it's more expensive, so mm, there's okay. trade-offs. All right, we're on our journey with new okay. products here. Right, Next up, next um, this, uh, we just put it in the store. Yeah. And this is a big deal, this is... We had this for signups, and yeah. now we have it in. It is the Pi TFT 3.5 inch. I wanted to um, tweak the kernel a little bit and update the Debian package, and I learned how to do that today. Um, this, so we have it now in the store and live, and you can buy it. It is 480 by 320 pixels. It plugs right onto your Pi. It works with Pi Model A, Model B, Model B Plus, all the Pis. Um, we have a, a install scripts that installs our kernel onto it, and then it, it actually just like boots right into the console, and you can run X, or you can run. Pi game, or you can run whatever that normally you'd use with the display. And uh, you can also have HDMI on the side. The HDMI is a different output, so you can have both if you want. Um, it's a lot for the Pi to do, but if you want, you can have like, you know, something running on the HDMI monitor and then little display for something else. Mm -hmm. uh, our 2.8 inch Pi TFT is really, really popular, and so we wanted to upgrade to a bigger screen. So this is twice the resolution, but it's not twice as big. It's only a little bit bigger, so the density is much nicer, the pixel okay. density. And this one has a resistive screen. We'll eventually have a capacitive screen too, but uh, you know, there's definitely no ETA on that. I haven't even started. Mm -hmm. But resistive works quite so well for most people. A lot people. of the Pi yeah. stuff has been going on probably while you've been knee deep in book writing. Are you going to play around with Pi stuff or have you? I have played around with Pi stuff. Um, I made one of those little Pi laptop tablets with the uh, oh, cool. Atrix. Uh, oh, uh, the laptop dock thing. Right, yeah, that's exactly. cool. Exactly. And um, uh, I go way back with Unix and all that stuff. So I was going to ask you, familiar. like, if you have a Unix background or if you've. Used I that. I do have some, and and I did that at Boeing, and uh, uh, I did some things that might actually be called hacking right now. <laughs> as, as, as far as capturing coworkers' uh, passwords and stuff, but uh, okay. no. So so this. I, I really find the the Raspberry Pi uh, a great product because it, it actually allows you to use a, a larger operating system, but not something either ob obscure as like Risk OS or something unless yeah. you really want to. And then the ecosphere that that is creating both the hardware 
Adafruit and other companies, yeah. and the software. I mean, um, people are writing libraries, and again, you don't have to, if you don't want to, uh, try to figure out all the, the nitty gritty. You can just say, oh, there's open source material out there, and, and I can take that. Yeah, and yeah there's like, again, like Python libraries, like there's tons of Python code. So yeah, I'm just showing the, um, here's the display live. It's got four little mounty holes that you can, they're perforated, so you can break them off with pliers if you don't want little mounting tabs. It's exactly the same size as a pie, so if you have like a case that just, just fits the pie that way, it'll, it'll snap right on. And um, I just have a keyboard connected to the pie, so I'm gonna log in. So yeah, you, just, you can use it as a console, and then um, I will start X. Hopefully it'll not crash, I don't know why it would. Live demo. There you go. Um, and yeah, you have a you know a fairly large uh, display here that you can run stuff in. So like for example, if I want to run Idle, um, or you can run a web browser if you want. You can you know use the touch screen, or you can use a mouse and keyboard. Um, all's good. And yeah, it is. It's, it's big enough that you can actually use it for a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think it'll be popular. Um, it uses SPI, and for the resistive touch screen and the display, you can get like. 20 frames a second, uh, depends on what you're doing. Um, if you're trying to play video, just remember the, you know, the pie itself is not great at no. playing video, but uh, you know, it, can, it can display stuff at about 20 frames a second or faster um, okay. if you overclock it. All right, lady, we're gonna so, kick it up a notch. We got to, we're moving on. We got like eight rows of products to go through. Right. Okay, yeah. here's some um, cables. Things. Oh, this is an extension cable. Yeah, yeah this is actually used for a, a, a future project, but it's basically if you have something that uses a 40 pin flex, um, connector like our TFT displays and you want to extend it like see here you've extended it mm -hmm. uh, this little extender you can plug the FPC into one end and then you know whatever 20 centimeters later um, you've got the other end of the cable it's just an extender uh, but handy yeah. if you're like I want this display to be farther away from the driver board um, even though like sometimes you're not supposed to like extend like high-speed lines you know you can try it often it works just fine okay next up Extendy. Right, we got a book. Um, this one, uh, by request, designing circuit boards with Eagle. Um, once we started um, selling the Lady Ada selected versions of uh, of Eagle, a lot of people said, um, "Well, I'd really like to to learn Eagle." So, um, do you use any um, CAD tools at all? Um, yes, uh, I I took a great course on KiCad with okay. uh, the Wylam guys. Oh yeah, yeah. And we have a KiCad badge and a Gita badge that uh, workshops use to award when um, people learn it. And then today, um, Altium has a, like a free version yeah, they're trying they to put online, oh, great. which a lot of people have been asking for free Altium for like years mm -hmm. because it's like it's a great Altium tool. Altium is a, is a very good tool. I, I don't do anything that needs it. We don't do like yeah. anything that like requires Altium. A lot of the stuff we do, even, you know, Eagle now has matched trace length. So like the only thing that was really like, oh, I wish you could do serpentines, like Eagle does mm -hmm. it now. You know, is Eagle the best? No, but <laughs> it's also not the worst. It's very uh, ubiquitous. It's very too. ubiquitous, and all CAT software is difficult, mm. so given that, <laughs> uh, I'm going to stick okay. with what I know. So I have a book. Um, next up, this is kind of a big deal. Um, we worked on this for a while with the folks from Leap Motion. We are one of the few companies that have the Leap Motion sensor. Mm. So it's... Um, it's a USB device. Yeah, I guess you should describe it, because it's, it's, it's weird. It's not yeah, like, it's it uses... Like, it's basically... it. it Without infringing anybody's patents, <laughs> patents, I believe it uses the same technology as Connect, right. similar, mm -hmm. where which isn't actually uh, people have experimented with this before. It's, it uses an IR camera and an IR grid or mesh, and it projects that mesh, and then it can detect the mesh. I mean, the, the demo shows it being able to detect each finger. I'm not. Yeah, everybody I'm loves spinning globes with their hands oh, yeah, for that's demos. Fun. That's a lot of fun. <laughs> I, can do basic motion detection. There's an API. I think detecting each individual finger, you know, depends a little bit on the um, light and, and usage and people's hands and stuff. But you can, I think, do uh, like the demos of the, this one where you can sort of do hand motions. I think does work. And there's a community of, of developers, a couple thousand developers, who are doing stuff with Elite Motion. So I thought it would be an interesting thing to add since it is a, it's a sensor like many others that we carry in the store. And they seem to be really interested in getting a developer community. And you know, there's not like a made for Elite Motion like thing you have to pay into. It's like anyone can develop yeah. for it. They encourage it. And uh, yeah. I, 
my wife really wanted one, we bought one, and they must have thought I was a developer because they keep asking me to to try to join <laughs> the developer group, and it's like, no, well, I'm I'm just trying to get the wife acceptance and the, yeah. the, do that. Um, it's, 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 coming soon next year, uh, getting started with Leap Motion SDK by Mike Barella. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's oh. the problem. Oh, wow. Well, that's a lot of writing awesome. So. <laughs> All right. Moving right along, Lady Ada. Okay. This what is actually else is there? a subpart of the next part. This is a little adapter board that we made for the click. Uh, touch screen add on uh, HDMI monitor. So we now have a 5 inch 800 by 480 monitor. Um, we have one with a little uh, HDMI only driver. We also have one with a bigger driver that can do VGA and, um, uh, and composite in. Okay. And basically, what we do is the, these screens have a resistive layer over them, and we split out those resistive lines and connect it, have a USB connector so you can. Um, use this with actually any computer that has HDMI and USB. It shows up like a mouse, and you have a resistive screen. So I can show it on the overhead. Okay. And I should plug it into a Pi, but you don't have to use it with a Pi. You can use it with anything you want. I used it with a. Oh, um, there. I used it with a, a Beagle Bone Black and uh, a Windows computer. Oh, can you um, can you actually hide my facey face? I'm gonna hide you. Yeah, because <laughs> there's not a lot of space. You're gone. Um, so this is, I just uh, turned down the light because it's it's so bright from here. Um, but yeah, you have a uh, you have it connected to USB through this little adapter, and we'll eventually have like some sort of enclosure or something. And then you know this just looks like a mouse. You can see it every time it detects a press, it actually blinks a little bit. And um, these are you know we calibrate these in the factory, so when you get it, it's just ready to go. And yeah, you can you know pretty much just do whatever you want. That's cool. Um, with the uh, with a monitor and use it as a as a generic touch screen. What I like about this is it's not too big. A five inch display, it's like it's kind of like tablet sized, mm -hmm. but you know it, it basically because it can run HDMI. It's it's HDMI. It can work with any computer. So if people want to do um, single board computer interfaces that had touch screens, but they wanted more resolution than the Pi TFT. So this is 800 by 480. So that's um, almost three times as much resolution as the Pi TFT 3.5 inch. So okay. yeah, it's basically we have multiple touchscreen solutions like Pi TFT sits on top. This is HDMI, so it can it's you know higher resolution and you know it's much faster um, and much bigger, but it's more expensive. So there's just trade offs. Okay, and then I guess this is um, another. Yeah, then we one. have the version. This is I think the version that has the. Um, it's just a bigger driver. Okay. So, so the HDMI driver in this one also can do VGA input or composite input. Okay. So if you have something that has composite output for some reason and you want a mouse, I don't I don't know what that would be, but let's say you do, or it has VGA, which is pretty common if you have a, a computer that has VGA output and doesn't have HDMI, uh, you can use this monitor just fine with that as well. So okay. we have it's a little bit more expensive though because that's all the extra ports. So again, trade off: do you want HDMI only, less expensive, or uh, VGA or composite or HDMI input, and it's you know a little bit bigger. Okay, we're still knee deep in new products here. We're doing it. So um, we've got these knobs. Knobs. Um, you know. But these are the best knobs. Okay. <laughs> these knobs are the best, and like people we're, like. I'm we've got three ready. colors. We've got them in red, white, and blue, which is. Yay, yay America. Yay, America. <laughs> or French. Yeah. Or French, depending. Um, and these are soft touch knobs. Now I can't. We don't have some sort of simulator that lets you f f go put your hand through the display and feel how nice and sticky these knobs are. Yeah. But they have a nice, soft, rubbery silicone feel that is really grippy. Because I really hate like the hard plastic knobs. These are nice and soft. Okay. And they fit. Um, I like they have such an opinion about. <laughs> how many? See, you know what? Until until you have really crappy knobs, and then you're yeah. like, I wish I had those soft touch knobs. And I have to agree. I've I've used a lot of knobs in projects over the years, and a lot of them came from Radio Shack, and they were hard and slippery. And these are extremely <laughs> nice. As far as <laughs> no, if you want to dial in exact, <coughs> excuse me, values. These are the knobs. So <laughs> okay, you know you what? Guys I have very, opinions. I have opinion, but you know what? Everyone who like is building synthesizers or so control like panels a, are like, yes. oh yeah. Uh, and these are um, this is a T18, so this is the 18th spline. Just very standard. Uh, the other standard is D shaft. Well, I'm working on getting D shaft ones too, but for now, uh, I have T18s. These are well known, and yeah, they're skirted and they're lovely. And I don't know, I love these knobs. Okay. And they fit great on the potentiometers we have in the uh, the panel mount and breadboard friendly ones in the in the shop. So yeah. Okay. So tweak all you like. Well, well we have plenty of knobs. Next up. 
Um, we have an updated version of our ruler. Yes. Our PCB ruler. By popular ruler. demand, we now have the ruler with one tenth inch markings, not one eighth inch. Because <laughs> all you electrical engineers were like, well, everything is at a point one inch. <laughs> Uh, grid, and so we want to have the grid on the ruler too. And I'm like, yeah, but no ruler has one tenth, unless you're an architect and they have those scale rulers. But anyways, it's now one tenth. Okay, okay. I hope you're all happy. Okay. The one eighth people are going to be very sad. They're going to be so pissed. But you know what? I understand. Most stuff is point one inch boundaries. Okay. Next yeah. up. JTAG adapter. This is a thing that you only need if you know you need it. So if you don't know <laughs> that you need it, you're probably like, what the heck is this? Um, if you have something like a SIGGER uh, JTAG programmer, uh, which like I have holding up here, like we sell in the store, uh, we have the EDU version, you can get other JTAG adapters. They often have this ginormous, chunky 20-pin uh, connector, which is uh, great if you have like a motherboard, but not great if you're making like a little Cortex M3 or M4 or even M0 um, eval board or breakout board. Oftentimes you'll use a little SWD connector, which is a teeny little guy. I'll show it on the overhead how teeny it is. It is a half an inch pitch. So um, this little cable, it basically adapts from this chunky cable, a little chunky cable to this little one. We will be releasing boards that use this connector, so we have to have an adapter because, well, like you can tell, it's like you can't breadboard to this little cable. And um, yeah, it's this adapter. If you know you need it, you're like, oh, I need that. Um, we have it. Um, it's great. Does it big to small. And then we have these cables sold separately. They're the little SWD cables. If you don't have one, you can get a cable. Oftentimes, you have the cable. You just need the adapter. So hmm. there you go. SWD. Okay. J tag. Next up, um, I can do this one. So we got this in. We are continuing to put in more um, types of filament. So uh, this is the Ninja Flux, and this is yeah. a new color. This is silver, metallic. So do you want me to hold it up? Yeah. If you want to. Wow, you thank it. you, engineer. All right. Like it's metallic. I mean, it's not shiny metallic, but it is a, is a silvery metallic. You know, it's like a silver color. Yeah. So this oh, is shiny. flexible um, filament for yeah. your 3D printers. I like how it's, yeah, it's desaturated Adafruit Black, as, yeah. we, as we oh. mentioned last week. Next <laughs> up, we have amazing wow. ways to charge things. Yeah. Wirelessly. Yeah. These okay. are the wireless chargers that okay. adapt to USB. I know. These are weird. So we're going to have more photos of this soon because this is an unusual Yeah. Thing. I'm not seeing any other place have these. Ooh. How did you? Okay. What, what so are these? So these are little add -on. I don't know what the heck they're really for, but they're, you know, they're basically little uh, wireless uh, chi key charging modules. These are receivers. So if you have a charging plate that's the standard, the key wireless charging standard, mm -hmm. these are the receivers. This is what you put on the thing that you want mm -hmm. to charge with your charging plate. Mm -hmm. And they come in, what? I just want to see what okay. Yeah, it's okay. See, if you have a dumb phone that doesn't have the charger yeah, in it. Yeah, it doesn't. You oh, stick okay. it on the back. Right. And then you, you have a You can make your USB own wireless charger. Um, on mine's top. on top. Yes, yeah, so yeah. I'm totally going to just take advantage of your uh, your kindness. So what you would do is. <laughs> and that was the last would, time you saw your and phone. And that's the last time you saw your phone. So you, you have to basically get the one that orients properly. So this one is oriented this way. Mm -hmm. And then, okay. yeah, you stick it on the back, and like now you have a, a key charging phone. Congratulations. Exactly. Yeah. And then um, we also have a longer one. And then they, there's two versions. There's the forward and reverse. So if you see this one, it goes on the, the little USB, the micro USB connector has a little notch. So of course you have to get it in the right way. So check the images to make sure, depending on each phone is different. Like sometimes yeah. it's forward, sometimes reverse. Mm -hmm. If you have a larger tablet type thing or it's from the side and you want to have it flip around, you'll need this one. So there's four options, short and long. And yeah, they give you five volts out and you have to get the charging dish, but they're available at most phone stores. Yeah, I, I picked one up really inexpensively. Okay, and, uh, great. great. Right, this is for you. Oh, thank you. Okay. 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 All right. You can take it home because this is handy. Now it, you're it's like, great. Okay. Right. Next up, we've got Sorry. um drill bits. Drill bits. <laughs> We're also gonna have end mills soon, but the drill bits came in first. We have PCB drills. These are very hard carbide drills. They're used for drilling PCBs. Um, that's why they're a little expensive. They're not like cheap drill bits, like one eighth inch, you know, mild steel bits or whatever you get. These are these are high speed carbide drill bits, and they come in, in a nice little protective thingy. And we have them in 0 0.5, 0 0.7, 0 0.9, and 1.1 1 .1, uh, millimeter. Do you use this in a Dremel? Or you can use this. I use actually mm. a Dremel drill because mm. it's a high speed drill. Mm -hmm. uh, you do want to run, especially if you're drilling PCBs, which is what we use them for, you do want to have them run a little bit uh, fast. 
Um, I don't remember exactly the speed, but check out. I, I did wear a tutorial about drilling PCBs, and I think I just say like 500 RPM or faster. I think is. I didn't even want like 1,000 RPM, but um, look at the tutorial. And uh, yeah, you can just uh, use these in your little hand drill, or if you have something. The only thing is you need to make sure that your drill is when you go down, it goes straight. Straight. Because these are very thin; they'll break if it's twisted. But these are hardened. I mean, your your normal tiny drill bits typically break very easily. These don't break terribly easily, but I mean, they, it is like 0.5 millimeter, you know, diameter. They're they yeah. they are fine. So just watch out. Like yeah. you know, I, we have ones that last us. For like a half a year until like you bump it while you're drilling and then it, it cracks off. But mm -hmm. for the most part, they're quite good. We'll we'll have end mills as well soon um, okay. for people who want end mills. These are only for drilling, not for side to side action. Mm -hmm. All right, Lita, you got like three more products and then yeah. we are what? Whew. Done. Okay. Yeah. This, this is, is cool. you've wanted this for a while. This is very interesting. And when I saw this, I was like, "What is that?" And I'm like, "Oh, I really like this." And I'll actually set up a little. Demo, hold on. Actually, yeah, so this is this is a laser break oh, no. beam sensor. Do I have it's that right? It's a laser break beam sensor, and it does exactly the opposite of what most laser break beam sensors do. And I'm actually going to use this. Sorry, give me a second for my okay. demo. So here's here's what it is. So usually, and I'll tell you what what it doesn't do. Usually, when you have a laser beam, you have to have the sensor on the other end of the laser. So this is like has a like mm. laser. Usually, you have to have a sensor over here. And then when you break it, the sensor no longer senses the beam, the light in it that would come out of the laser. And that way you know that the beam is broken. So if you want to do like a laser break beam sensor. Um, problem is you have to have that, that sensor perfectly calibrated. Like, because the, the beam spot is so small that even on the other side, like a meter away, if you don't have like the sensor, the photo cell, really big and also like centered, uh, it also can get dirty, and so this is a little bit of a problem that you have to have something on the other side. Well, this is a weird sensor that has um, a lens, so you've got the laser diode part, but there's also a lens with a, a, a light sensor, and the light sensor is looking for the beam uh, up to about a meter away. So instead of having something on the opposite side, you can it just uses this lens to detect the reflection of the beam. So, um, uh, so you don't have, it just if it if it doesn't get the reflection anymore, that it thinks it's broken. Right. So for example, mm -hmm. here's the beam, and then well, sorry, and then I, just, I there's a trinket, but it's actually not used. I just used it for a power supply here. So the beam is is all the way on the wall over there. But then when I put my hand, it senses it that that beam is reflected off my hand, and it uh -huh. sees that spot, and then it says the beam is broken. So. I just to make sure I don't bump it into anything else on the table. So yeah, as oh, I put neat. my hand in front of it, it detects it. So the only trade-off is that it has to be able to see that reflection. So you can't use it. We tried a couple of things. First of all, hands work great, as well as anything that's like shiny and reflective. If you have someone wearing a sweater, it doesn't mm. work as well because the sweater doesn't reflect the beam of light. It disperses it. So you have to keep that in mind. It also depends on the light levels you want. If you want to have a good contrast spot. But for many projects, where you want to have a, um, a break beam, this will work quite well. Okay. All right, next up. We just put this in the store just a few hours ago. This is a DIY Gamer Kit. Yes. Wow. Gamer Kit. It's a little uh, DIY shield that plugs into a um, Arduino, and it has a display. It's a little kind of game toy. Uh, you can play Flappy Bird on it, from what I understand. You can play a couple games with it. I think, let me see what they, I don't even know what this is. This was built a while ago. Yeah. Yeah, so this is the Flappy Bird. Okay, I'll put it on there. Yeah, the Flappy Bird. <laughs> and then you press start, and then, okay, I've already lost. Shoot. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Hold on. Okay, let's go. Start. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, one. Okay, I'm so, really good at Flappy yeah. Bird, apparently. Um, so, yeah, there's a couple games. There's, like, Pong. <laughs> there's, like... Flappy Bird, there's Snake and Tetris and other other fun games. But honestly, like Flappy Bird, this is as good as the web version or the iOS version. What level are you up to Candy Crush now without without paying? You still haven't paid yet. What no, I'm up to like four sixty or something. Wow. I gotta finish this game, then I'm gonna get back to some engineering. <laughs> okay, yeah, because you've been really slacking off lately. <laughs> well, I've been yeah. playing Candy Crush all the time. So okay. um, it's a fun little portable game when it's on a nine volt. You can uh, you know play games, use an Arduino. If you want to have an Arduino project that's like portable and it has like an IR receiver and, and LEDs and it's, I think it's just fun. I think you do like multiplayer games even and there's a button and a light sensor. So it's kind of like a, it's a little bit of an explorer but like with the display built in. 
So oh, I nice. like the idea of the Explorer. You may okay, like Lady Ada, last product of the night. Oh, yeah? You got through it. Yep. Mm. It is the Pro Trinket backpack. Yes. So we have Trinket, we have Pro Trinket, Yay. and Pro Trinket mm -hmm. has a little backpack. And this is a neat little... What is this? Yeah, this is a neat little thing that I know you've uh, told me about many nights um, over dinner. You said, you know what would be really cool is if we had a little power supply, because then you'd be able to... And then you would just tell me a bunch of stuff I didn't understand. Okay. <laughs> so with the, with the Pro Trinket, um, I've been noticing a lot of projects that people have been building with Trinket or, or even Pro Trinket where they want to embed it in, in something portable and small. So they want it to be battery powered, but then they also want to be able to charge the battery. Right. And it, so I thought when designing the Pro Trinket, like maybe I should put battery charging capability built in, but then like, you know, it makes it a lot bigger. And if it's a connector and it adds a lot of expense, it, you know, so I, instead what it did was, I designed the Pro Trinket, which is like just the, the basics, and then I made a board that fits on top. And it's a little backpack, so you can see it's, it's, it, there's another board on top of it that gets soldered on, and it, it has pass-through pins. And then you can plug in a LiPo battery. So I have this little 100 milliamp, but you can use any size LiPo or lithium-ion battery. And as a built-in lithium-ion charger, and like right now I'm charging it, but when I unplug it, the you can kind of see the, the green power LED, it's still working. Mm -hmm. And so you can run your project off of a LiPo and then charge it in when you need to, or plug it into USB to charge it or reprogram it, and it's kind of free running. So it's basically like a built-in uh, backup battery UPS um, capability. And uh, it'll work with both the 5-volt and the 3-volt trinket. 5-volt trinket, you'd technically be overclocking, but I've never found that to be a problem. Mm. With a 3-volt trinket, of course, it works great. The battery gives you 3.7 volts, and it gets regulated down to 3.3. So this should let you do projects where you only have the micro USB port available, and then you just plug it in to recharge the battery when the battery's low, or uh, to program the Pro Trinket if you to program it in. And there's also two pins on the uh, two pads on the um, backpack that you can cut a trace and then connect a switch. So if you want to have an on-off switch, it has the ability to also be an on-off switch. You can charge it and then have it be off, and then when you want, you just turn it on and it'll run off the battery when it's on. That's great for uh, all kinds of uh, wearable types. Yeah, stuff. little wearables, project, like a lot of the trinket projects you did. The only thing is that the pin now doesn't match the trinket, so this is only for Pro Trinket. Right. But going forward, I'm going to try to make all my boards use these three pins in a row so that you can mm. use it for any future board, because it's, it's a common question. People are like, well, I like this yeah. eval board or dev board, a little mini thing, but I, I want to add battery. It's it, Because these little lipo, lipo poly batteries are so inexpensive, everybody wants to add them, because it's yeah. like five bucks for a little battery, now it's portable, you don't have to get double A's or triple A's. Mm -hmm. uh, it's in, it's in there's name. shields, there's capes, there's blocks, and now there's backpacks. Yes. Well, I mean, just generic backpack. I don't think I'm gonna have more than one. Yeah, okay, just one backpack? Yeah. Okay, all right. Power backpack. And with that? Fruit. Is, Fruit. is the, that was new products. All right, whew, you got through it.